A gruesome story leads off our newscast. Milwaukee police found body parts in a north side apartment and now they wonder if they've uncovered some kind of death factory. This was the scene earlier this morning. Police hired a private contractor to haul a refrigerator and a tank of acid out of the apartment in the 900 block of North 25th Street. Because of the acid, some neighbors were evacuated briefly. Police found parts of bodies, leading them to believe the man they arrested is a mass murderer. From our investigation, we feel that this individual strongly is involved in other homicides. Uh, we have taken evidence out of the building by the medical examiner to be examined. What brought the police here in the first place? The officers were stopped by an individual who claimed he was in the apartment and became engaged in a dispute with the owner of the apartment and uh, left the apartment and called the officers. Uh, thoughts wanting to control them, to, uh, I don't know how to put it, uh, possess them permanently. And that's why you killed them? Right. Right. Not because I was angry with them, not because I hated them, but because I wanted to keep them with me. And uh, as my obsession grew, uh, I was saving body parts such as uh, skulls and uh, skeletons. Jeffrey Dahmer was born in Milwaukee on May 21st, 1960, to Lionel and Joyce Dahmer. He was described as an energetic and happy child until the age of four, when a traumatic and painful recovery following surgery to correct a double hernia seemed to affect a change in the boy. As a child, he showed an interest in dismembering animals, and his fascination with death became increasingly apparent. As Dahmer entered first grade, his father's studies kept him away from home much of the time. When he was home, his wife, who suffered from depression, demanded constant attention and spent an increasing amount of time in bed. Consequently, neither parent devoted much time to their son, who later recollected that, from an early age, he felt unsure of the solidity of the family. Uh, I'd leave the house, go out in the woods and uh, sulk, brooding, you know, wondering why they had to uh, have such a rough relationship. Your dad says that somewhere around the age of six, he thought that you began to change, that you began to withdraw, that you became much more shy. Oh yeah, that's, that's the time I really, really remember uh, noticing that things weren't quite right. So it wasn't so much innate shyness as it was wanting to withdraw from tension and arguments and problems in the house. That's how I saw it, yeah. Just, uh, I, I, uh, sort of uh, lived in my own little fantasy world when things got too heated in the household. It was just uh, just my own little world where I had control. At elementary school, Dahmer was regarded as quiet and shy. One teacher recollected she detected early signs of abandonment due to his father's absence and mother's illnesses, the symptoms of which increased when she became pregnant with her second child. Dahmer chose the name of his baby brother and called him David. The Dahmer family was constantly moving, and while in Bath Township, Ohio, Dahmer began collecting large insects and the skeletons of small animals, such as chipmunks and squirrels. Some of these remains were preserved in jars of formaldehyde. Two years later, during a chicken dinner, Dahmer asked his father what would happen if the chicken bones were placed in bleach. Lionel, pleased by what he believed to be his son's scientific curiosity, demonstrated how to safely bleach and preserve animal bones. Dahmer incorporated these preserving techniques into his bone collecting. He also began collecting dead animals, including roadkill, which he would dissect and bury. By age 14, he had begun drinking beer and hard alcohol in the daylight hours. When he reached puberty, Dahmer discovered he was gay. He could not tell his parents' cause of fear. He began fantasizing about dominating and controlling a completely submissive male partner in his early to mid-teens. When Dahmer turned 18, his parents had a divorce and his mother, Joyce, moved out with his younger brother, David, while his father also remarried later. Dahmer was living alone in the house, but he still managed to graduate from high school. Dahmer committed his first murder three weeks after graduation. He picked up a hitchhiker named Stephen Mark Hicks, who was almost 19. Dahmer lured Hicks to his house on the pretext of drinking. Hicks, 
who was hitchhiking to a rock concert at Chippewa Lake Park, Ohio, agreed to accompany Dahmer to his house upon the promise of a few beers with Dahmer as he had the house to himself. After several hours of talking, drinking, and listening to music, Hicks wanted to leave and I didn't want him to leave. He struck Hicks twice from behind with the dumbbell as Hicks sat upon a chair. When Hicks fell unconscious, Dahmer strangled him to death with the bar of the dumbbell, then stripped the clothes from Hicks's body before exploring his chest with his hands, then masturbating as he stood above the corpse. Hours later, Dahmer dragged the body to the basement, dissolved the body in acid, crushed the bones with a sledgehammer, and sprinkled them in the woods behind the house. One of your dad's biggest questions is when you began to slip away, when you crossed over into this world of obsession or dark fantasy from which you just couldn't return. I think it was around <clears throat> age 14 or 15, started have, having obsessive uh, thoughts of, of uh, violence intermingled with sex and it just got worse and worse uh, I didn't know how to tell anyone about it so I didn't I just kept it all inside these things that I've been wondering is just how on earth how it got established with entrails you know with the right. insides of dogs or foxes as you um, made your way around the neighborhood and I think it started started it maybe started out as just uh, childhood curiosity just yeah. to see what it looked like right inside or, right and uh, something something went wrong was was there some pleasure in in the cutting open of the animal yes there was no no sexual pleasure but just a um, it's hard to describe. Sense of power, sense of control. I suppose that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Uh, I wish I just keep on kept on going, but I didn't. I turned around, picked him up, and uh, that's when that's when it, the nightmare became a reality. What happened after you took him to the house? Uh, we talked, had some drinks. I knocked him out, and that was, that was the first time. Six weeks after the murder of Hicks, Dahmer's father and his fiancée returned to his home, where they discovered Dahmer living alone. That August, Dahmer enrolled at Ohio State University. He dropped out of Ohio State University after one quarter term, and his recently remarried father insisted that he join the Army. Dahmer enlisted in late December 1978 and was posted to Germany shortly thereafter. His drinking problem persisted, and in early 1981, the Army discharged him. Following his discharge, Dahmer returned home to Ohio. An arrest later that year for disorderly conduct prompted his father to send him to live with his grandmother, Catherine Dahmer, in Wisconsin, but his alcohol problem continued. He was arrested once again in 1986 when two boys accused him of masturbating in front of them he received a one-year probationary sentence. It wasn't until September 1987 that Dahmer took his second victim, Stephen Tuomi. They checked into a hotel room and partied. Dahmer eventually awoke to find Tuomi dead, with no memory of the previous night's activities. Dahmer bought a large suitcase to transport Tuomi's body to his grandmother's basement, where he dismembered and masturbated on the corpse before disposing of the remains. For two weeks following Tuomi's killing, Dahmer retained Tuomi's head wrapped in a blanket. In September 1988, Dahmer lured a 13-year-old Laotian boy to his house, claiming he wanted to take nude photos of him. This resulted in charges of sexual exploitation and second-degree sexual assault for Dahmer. He pleaded guilty, claiming that the boy had appeared much older. While awaiting sentencing for his sexual assault case, Dahmer again put his grandmother's basement to gruesome use. In March 1989, he lured, drugged, strangled, sodomized, photographed, dismembered, and disposed of Anthony Sears. An aspiring model, Dahmer found Sears particularly attractive and later said he did not want to lose him. And so Sears became the first victim from whom Dahmer kept preserved body parts for a long period of time, mummifying his head and genitals. 
On May 14, 1989, Dahmer moved out of his grandmother's house into 924 North 25th Street, apartment 213, Milwaukee, taking Sears' head with him. At his trial for child molestation in May 1989, Dahmer was arguing eloquently in his own defense about how he had seen the error of his ways and that his arrest marked a turning point in his life. His defense counsel argued that he needed treatment, not incarceration, and the judge agreed, handing down a one-year prison sentence on day release, allowing Dahmer to work at his job during the day and return to the prison at night, as well as a five-year probationary sentence. Over the next two years, Dahmer would kill 12 more people, bringing his total victim count to 17. His first victim during this time was a prostitute named Raymond Smith, whom Dahmer lured to his apartment for sex, gave a drink laced with sleeping pills, and then strangled. Dahmer took photos of his body in suggestive positions before dismembering him. With his next victim, Edward Smith, Dahmer accidentally destroyed his skull while trying to dry it in the oven, making it explode. He later told police he felt rotten about Smith's murder because was unable to keep anything from his body, making it feel like a true waste. Some kind of desire to keep these people with you, not to be abandoned, not to have them leave. I think it, it, that did play into it, but uh, there was a big element of wanting complete control over someone, total control. Uh, not having to, to consider their wishes, being able to keep them there as long as I wanted. And uh, that, that was a big part of it. Lust played a big part of it, controlling lust. Once it happened the first time, it just seemed like uh, it had control of my life from there on end. I, it it uh, was a major part of my thinking from then on. Did you want to try to stop? Yes, I, I tried. I tried to stop. Says in 1984, while living here at his grandmother's house in Milwaukee, his violent compulsions consumed him once again. One night, cruising these bars in downtown Milwaukee, he met a young man and took him to this hotel. I had put some sleeping pills in his drink to render him conscious. And, uh, I was just going to spend the night with him. When I woke up in the morning, uh, my forearms were bruised, and his chest was, was bruised, and blood was coming out of his mouth. He was hanging over the side of the bed. And uh, I have no memory of beating him to death, but I must have. And that's when it, when it all started again. And once it started again, you found it impossible to stop. Right, that, that's when the, the obsession went into full swing. My, my only objective was to find the, the best looking uh, guy that I could. I went to bathhouses, I went to bars, um, shopping malls. Uh, their sexual preference didn't matter to me. Uh, Did their race matter to you? No, their race didn't matter to me. The first, the first two Young men were white, the, set, the third young man was American Indian, the fourth and fifth were Hispanic. So no, race had nothing to do with it. It was just their looks. Was it the killing that excited you, or is it what happened after the killing? No, the, the killing was just a means to an end. That, that was the least set, uh, satisfactory part. I didn't enjoy doing that. Mm -hmm. That's why... I tried to uh, create uh, living zombies with uh, uretic acid in the, in the drill. Dahmer started developing rituals as he progressed with his killings, experimenting with chemical means of disposal and often consuming the flesh of his victims. Dahmer also attempted crude lobotomies. He drilled into the skull of his 11th victim, Errol Lindsay, while he was still alive and injected him with muriatic acid. Dahmer hoped this would place Lindsay into a permanent submissive state, but Lindsay awoke during the procedure and said, I have a headache, what time is it? So Dahmer strangled him. On May 27, 1991, Dahmer's neighbor Sandra Smith called the police to report that an Asian boy was running naked in the street. When the police arrived, the boy was incoherent, and they accepted the word of Dahmer, a white man in a largely poor black community. 
that the boy was his 19-year-old lover. In fact, the boy was 14 years old and was, unknown to Dahmer, the younger brother of the Laotian teen Dahmer had molested three years earlier. The police escorted Dahmer and the boy home. Clearly not wishing to become embroiled in a homosexual domestic disturbance, they took only a cursory look around before leaving. According to Dahmer, an officer peeked his head around in the bedroom but didn't really take a good look, and then left after telling Dahmer to take care of the boy. Once they left the scene, Dahmer injected hydrochloric acid into the boy's brain, killing him. Had the police conducted even a basic search, they would have found the body of Dahmer's 12th victim, Tony Hughes. Dahmer's killing spree ended when he was arrested on July 22, 1991. The body parts found in Dahmer's refrigerator and Polaroid photographs of his victims became inextricably associated with his notorious killing spree. Two Milwaukee police officers were led to Dahmer when they picked up Tracy Edwards, a 32-year-old man who was wandering the streets with handcuffs dangling from his wrist. They decided to investigate the man's claims that a weird dude had drugged and restrained him. They arrived at Dahmer's apartment, where he calmly offered to get the keys for the handcuffs. Edwards claimed that the knife Dahmer had threatened him with was in the bedroom. When the officer went in to corroborate the story, he noticed Polaroid photographs of dismembered bodies lying around. Dahmer was subdued by the officers, after which he muttered the words, For what I did I should be dead. Subsequent searches revealed a head in the refrigerator, three more in the freezer, and a catalog of other horrors, including preserved skulls, jars containing genitalia, and an extensive gallery of macabre Polaroid photographs of his victims. Dahmer later said he had planned to build a private altar from his victims' skulls, adorned with incense sticks and globe lights. He hoped the altar would be a place where he could feel at home. Dahmer was convicted and sentenced to 999 years in prison with no chance of parole. His life was cut short when he was murdered by a fellow inmate, Christopher J. Scarver, in 1994. ...experiments to create a living zombie was conducted on this 14-year-old boy. Jeffrey had drilled a hole in his head and poured in acid, a crude attempt at lobotomy that none of his victims survived. No, the killing wasn't, wasn't the objective. I just wanted to have the person under my complete control uh, to do with as I wanted. It's not easy to say that, but that's, that's what the motive was. Was there something sexual in the dismemberment of the bodies for you? As time went on, uh, yes, I, I did get a, there was a sexual part, part to that. Uh, I started saving the, the skeletons and preserving other parts. And uh, one thing led to another. It took, it took more and more uh, deviant-type behaviors to satisfy uh, my urges. And so it just spiraled out of control. Why the cannibalism? That was, that was another step. Uh, it, it, it made me feel like they were a permanent part of me. Besides, besides the just mere curiosity of what it would be like, it made them feel that they were a part of me, and it, it gave me a, a sexual uh, uh, satisfaction to do that. Your dad has wondered about all kinds of things, from the medication that your mom was on during her pregnancy, to the fact that you were exposed to violent arguments in the home from an early age and continuing to the possibility that he might have passed on some genetic propensity for obsession or violent behavior. Does any of that ring true to you? I, I can see why he'd wonder about those things, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, they're all excuses. I feel it's uh, wrong for people who commit crimes to try to shift the blame onto somebody else, onto their parents or onto their, their upbringing or cir living circumstances. I, I think that's just a, a cop-out. I take full responsibility. How do you feel about what you did? I'm glad that it's over. There, there's nothing, any words I say to the, to the victim's families are, are just going to seem trite and empty. Uh, 
I, I don't know how to express the regret, the sorrow. Um, that I feel for what I've done for their, for their sons. Uh, I can't find the right words. Is it still there, Jeff? Does it ever go away? In part, no, it never, it never completely goes away. I'll uh, probably have to live with it for the rest of my life. I wish it would go away. I wish I, there was some way to completely get rid of, of the, the compulsive thoughts, the feelings. Uh, it's not nearly so bad now that there, there's no avenues to, to actually act on it. But uh, no, it never seems to go completely away. So the thoughts still come to you? Sometimes, yeah.